All right, welcome to the studio. Um, we're going to go ahead today and talk a little bit about how to stretch a piece of paper. Um, this is a neat little trick. This is a, a project that um, a lot of students enjoy. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the origins for this assignment or this particular technique in this project. Um, Adrian Van Suchlin uh, was a professor I studied with at Utah State University during my undergraduate uh, career and he went to Europe. He saw a lot of uh, frescoes and he loved the texture. Whether intentional or not, how some of the, the frescoes had aged over time and there's these beautiful drawings um, done into that plaster. And uh, this was his attempt in a way to a degree to kind of mimic the texture mimic the surfaces in his drawings using this technique. Um, it's very simple. Um, let me go ahead and show you how you can get started today. Uh, this is a gesso. Um, this is made by Utrecht. In my opinion, the only company I would buy gesso from. Today we're going to use the really cheap student grade gesso. Um, arguably the professional grade gesso which is about $50 a gallon. About a little over two times uh, the price of what this is. Um, this is about $18 currently a gallon. It's always changing. Uh, professional grade is about $50 a gallon, but it will last you a long time. And the professional grade gesso just has a higher degree of marble dust in it, so it has a little bit more tooth while you're working into it. This is actually used or designed to um, work as a primer and canvas, but today we're going to use it to go ahead and gesso a piece of paper. Incidentally, if you want to oil paint on a surface like this, be completely protected, or acrylic paint on a surface like this, you can. Um, the one thing you need to be sure that you're using is a fairly thick piece of paper. So today I have a sheet of Reeves BFK. So this is a printmaking paper. Um, it has two sides. The back side is actually the screen side. And um, when you're printing or when you're drawing or painting, you want to use the front side. The, uh, when they manufacture this, they lay it on top of screens, dries out. This side is actually the, the side that is meant to be uh, um, worked on, and it has a little bit more texture. So as you fill it, you'll find a little bit more tooth on that side of the paper. This side of the paper is a little smoother, and if you're in a good lighting scenario, you can actually see the screen pattern kind of on the back side of the paper. Not so crucial for this assignment, but just thought I would throw that out there so you'd learn about what side of the paper to use. Um, so for this, it's a very simple process. What we're going to use today um, is one brush. Um, we're going to use a plate here with a sponge. This is just an automotive sponge. I think, in fact, I bought it at the dollar store. Okay, and cut it in half. Um, and some water adhesive tape. So, step number one, um, you're going to need to acquire a board that um, can withstand the stretching of the paper. So believe it or not, if you used a really thin piece of, say, masonite, over time, the pressure of this paper stretching would actually warp and then snap the board in half. So what you need is if you are going to use a sheet of masonite, you need to use something to reinforce the back of it. So let me show you an example of what you might want to build if you get really serious about using this technique. Um, so this is a board with MDF um, on the front. It's uh, probably a quarter inch MDF um, and it's surrounded by um, poplar stripping. The poplar stripping is really important because it gives this board a bit of a bracing in case uh, there's some tension on it that makes it want to turn um, in a direction. So this border around the outside is really crucial. In this case I just stapled a handle on here because it does get a little bit heavy to carry around with you. But another option is you can use even a piece of plywood, but I would probably use half inch ply. I wouldn't end up using quarter inch ply. So you're going to need a surface with a, some kind of a, a border built around the back side um, that you can then end up using to stretch paper on. Uh, this process incidentally works really, really well with watercolors as well. There's a lot of uh, watercolors out there that use masking tape. It's a great, easy system. But there's also those watercolorists that prefer to use um, the water adhesive tape. So no right or wrong uh, practices. It's all a matter of uh, preferences. Okay, but let me go ahead and show you how simple this process is. You're just going to take your sheet of uh, Reeves BFK. If you have any extra tape on your board, um, 
just go ahead and remove it. It's not really necessary. Okay, and then what you're going to do is you're going to take the water adhesive tape and just size it. You know, it doesn't have to be exact, but just go ahead and even a little bit extra is fine. Make the sizes that you're going to need for your paper. And then what you need to do is take this water adhesive tape, store it away from the water source. Because if a little bit of water gets on the side of this tape, it's activated and it's really pretty much ruined because uh, it sticks together as you try to take it apart. So um, put this a long ways away from any kind of water source once you're done using your water adhesive tape after you're sizing, after you size your pieces rather. Okay, so now what you're going to do, much like if you stretch canvas, you're going to work in opposites. So here I have just a, a plate with a sponge in it, and you want the, you want the sponge to be pretty saturated with water. So I'm going to take that sponge, I'm going to take the water adhesive tape, with the adhesive side down, I'm going to run it through there. I'm going to check it against the lights. If you get this too wet, it doesn't stick very well. Unfortunately, if it's not wet enough, it doesn't, adhe it doesn't adhere very well. So, um, I put it up to the lights. I saw some nice highlights in there, so I know I'm good to go. So I'm going to lay that over my board. And then if you want to be um, diligent about keeping wrinkles out of your surface, go ahead and I'll move this out of the way so you can see what's going on. You want to use your hands like this, start in the center, and pull out, and that will remove any kind of wrinkles that might form. Okay, and notice I started on the longest side of the paper. Um, always start with your longest side first. Kind of push out any kind of bubbles that might occur. Grab your next piece of water piece of tape. Run it across there. Sometimes it's necessary to Take your sponge and flip it around um, if it's lost the moisture. So now that I've got it down on that surface, I'm going to, again, repeat the same process. Doing really great so far. We, have, we don't have any bubbles or wrinkles showing up. If you want to, you can come in with a pencil. You can mark a border if you want to keep it really exact. But ultimately, if this turns out to be a nice work that you're going to want to display, uh, you can just cut a mat and cover up this water adhesive tape portion. This water adhesive tape portion is not going to be removed from the board, um, or excuse me, from the paper. It will be removed from the board, and you'll actually cut that seam, at which point we'll demonstrate that technique a little bit later on. So, now what I'm going to do is just finish off this process again. Um, nothing too radical from the first time. Um, start in the center and work your way out. And if you have a little bit of extra material, just go ahead and push it around your board. If you're building your own board, you need to make sure that it's a couple inches larger than whatever paper you're going to use. If you don't end up using a heavy-duty paper like a Reeves BFK, you're going to end up losing um, any kind of control, and your paper will buckle. I don't know if, you're, uh, if you ever experienced this like when you're a little kid, you're in elementary school, you're working on a watercolor on a little, you know, regular piece of paper, and it buckles and, and bows all over the place. Well, the advantage of this is as you're working on your surface, it may buckle a little bit, but since it's stretched, it's actually going to dry flat. So even if you experience any kind of, um, any kind of uh, elevation change, if you will, in your paper, it's actually going to look just like Kansas. It's going to be as flat as Kansas once this thing dries. So um, there you have it. That's step number one. Step number two uh, is really fun. Um, if you're a, a watercolorist and you want a watercolor, um, right now, here you go on this uh, setup, you'd be good to go. What I'm going to demonstrate is a drawing technique or drawing surface. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the gesso and actually just gesso a texture right into the paper. Now the advantage of this is when we create a work of art, we can actually um, have a surface to work into and we can work what's called reductively. So we could create a layer of charcoal down here, for example, and then we could remove that layer of charcoal um, 
and work right into this wet of the gesso. And I'll demonstrate that here in a moment. But this is the way you get started. You don't have to be really particular in the way that you put it on. In fact, to be honest, a little bit of an irregular uh, um, brush mark tends to be better for the work. So I'm just trying to change the direction of the brush. You can create designs and patterns with the gesso if you want. It will dry and kind of model in that shape that you first lay down. So the key thing here is you've got to live, leave yourself adequate time for this to dry. Um, a couple hours, is, especially in our climate here in Washington, is required. A hair dryer can help speed it up somewhat, but I recommend just doing this a couple hours, if not 24 hours, before you want to draw on it. So this is step number one. We're going to let it dry a little bit, and uh, we'll return, and I'll show you how to prepare a ground to work into. All right. Don't worry. You're not at the doctor's office. You're just back here for the second go around uh, on our prepared gesso surface. So what I might suggest is gloving up. It's really not a bad idea. Uh, you're going to be working with materials that might get your hands pretty dirty. So here we have our prepared gesso ground. It's a piece of Reeves BFK paper that we use water adhesive tape on. Okay, so the gesso's had um, 48 hours to dry and I'm going to show you what you can do next. You can do a couple different things. So um, these are really cheap kitty brand uh, grade uh, student soft pastels. And you could actually take these pastels, kind of grind them into the surface here. And the gesso has got such a nice tooth um, that you can create all sorts of patterns. You can use different colors. There's really no right or wrong way. Um, one thing that I found does work really well is you can keep it predominantly warm or predominantly cool for one layer. And then you can actually put another layer of gesso on top of this. But this is where the gloves come in really handy. Let me push that so you can see it a little bit better. This is where the gloves come in really handy. You can work that soft pastel into your ground. I usually use really, really cheap materials for this initial ground. What we're doing is we're preparing a ground that we can draw into. Okay. The nice thing about this is it's a really forgiving surface and we can work reductively. So with an eraser, you can see we can work back into our ground. Um, or if you want, you can minimize that ground. It's a really flexible surface to work in. So that's working on a prepared gesso surface with soft pastels. Um, your other option is you could use an oil pastel. And again, this is the Reeves brand. It's really inexpensive. Um, it's sort of like Crayolas on steroids. It's just a little bit more waxy. Um, gloves are putting up a fight here. All right, so what I'm going to do is actually just show you how you can use the oil pastel to achieve the same kind of result. And this is a really fun process. You can experiment. Um, don't worry, it's not an equation. There's no wrong, there's no right. Um, way to approach this project, um, you can have a lot of fun with it. So here you can take a Viva paper towel, a little bit of mineral spirits work or some um, mineral spirits work quite well or if you want to use some turpentine, it'll work as effectively as the mineral spirits will in spreading this oil pastel. So in this regard, it's almost like working with oil paint. Um, you can see I can take that oil pastel, a little bit of solvent. It's another reason why I suggest using the gloves. And you can actually create a really, really neat texture. Um, and nothing says you have to stop at this point. If you want to repeat the process I've shown you earlier by doing another layer of gesso, you can build up layer upon layer and actually give it sort of a, sort of a old fresco feel. Um, you can really create some neat grounds, some prepared grounds to work into. And you can only do this when you build up with gesso. Um, you can actually 
take this process a little bit further and you can use a combination of gesso, you can use things like um, um, building supplies that you might use for laying tile, like quick set, mix it in with the gesso, and then you can actually use copper wire and do a copper point. Um, much like a silver point, you can just use the inside of a copper wire and dry, and it oxidizes over time, gives you a really cool line. That might be another lecture down the circuit. But anyhow, you've got all sorts of um, cool variations. And you can see with very little effort, I'm already creating some pretty unique textures that I can work into. And at this point, quite often I like to go to a figure drawing session or um, work from a live model and you can actually use Conte. At this point, I usually move away from the cheaper materials and move into a better material like a, like a Conte, for example. And then you can come in and you can start to you know, complete whatever your, your desired drawing might be. Okay, So it's a really nice, flexible medium. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. The possibilities are endless. I mean, it's really whatever you come up with. One reason why I really like this is, again, you can come in with the eraser, and if you built up multiple layers of gesso, you can actually erase into different layers. Well, this eraser is doing the opposite of what I was hoping to show you. But uh, you can actually come in here, here we go, and actually remove some of those layers and, and get some great highlights off of your forms. Okay, so if you're after some reflected light, whatnot on a shadow sphere, it's a great exercise um, in working on your values. Okay? So, um, simple process. This is the prepared ground gesso stretch surface paper assignment. So, I hope you tackle this one with gusto and have a great time. Until next time, um, we'll say goodbye, happy drawing, happy painting.